Hey now, everybody. Welcome back. Brand new Take Game podcast. And excited this week to have Justin Sparks on from Cryptech. Very cool tidbit. Justin was actually Cryptech's first employee. So we talk a little bit about the beginning and how the company has kind of transformed from technology to build out for new outfits, new materials, all that good stuff. And really unique for Justin lives out in Boise, Idaho. And he gets to spend, you know, just endless amount of time outdoors, five, six months a year, kind of working on some of this technology into the new gear and just communicating what's needed and getting it out to consumers. So really cool. And obviously, Justin's from Boise. So that area, we had to talk some elk hunting, some mule deer hunting. It's a great show. Hope you guys enjoy it. All right, boys and girls, we are live, brand new Take Game podcast, and excited to be back as always in a new show, and excited to talk to Justin Sparks from Cryptech. Justin, what's happening, man? Hey, bud, how are you? Good, man. Just uh, trying to stay away from the heat out here in Boise, Idaho. Yeah, what is what is your weather like out there right now? Well, the next five days, it's supposed to be over the hundreds, which is not real normal for us out here. But, yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit too warm for my liking. That's crazy. I was just literally going to complain about 82 degrees here. <laughs> yeah, we get a dry heat, so it's not as bad as probably some of the 82 with a lot of humidity, but it's definitely yeah. too, too hot. Yeah, no joke. We've been at 90-plus humidity like the last several days. So anytime I chat, I mean, you just walk outside and you're you're kind of like wet and sticky. So it's not not the most pleasant thing in the world for sure. That's brutal. Yeah, it is, man. So, well, a cool tidbit is Justin is like one of the original, if not the original, employees for Cryptech. So Justin, give me a little background on on that and how you became that guy, like one of the originals. Well, it kind of came together through a, a network of friends, but, you know, I started running their gear, um, Cryptic had, I was working for another company at the time, and they had sponsored our company with some gear, and I just started a relationship with Josh and Butch, and they were just kicking things off, and, you know, when we got the gear, you know, I spent some time in it and started, you know, creating ideas and other things that we could do to change things to make them better. And, and that's kind of how we started um, my relationship with Josh and Butch, you know, really started through email and phone calls. And then as, you know, we started spending more time together and, and I started running more of their gear and started working with some of their third parties, cut and sews, the factories. Um, it just continued to evolve from there. And my background um, is actually an architectural background, but before that, my grandfather had a guide and outfitting business, and so I spent a lot of time in the outdoors growing up and really learned, you know, what good gear meant, especially when you're spending a lot of time out there in the backcountry, and just took a lot of my experience from, you know, hunting, trapping, fishing, guiding, growing up as a kid, and started to apply that into the battlefield, the backcountry type mentality here at Cryptech. You know, it's so crazy, you know, talking about being a kid, I mean, do you ever just kind of laugh sometimes at, like, some of the stuff you, you know, wore and had in your gear list is, like, this is the stuff we used to use, and now it's so crazy, and, you know, now you're running cryptic. But, you know, I just remember going back all the way to, like, my early days of deer hunting and literally wearing, you know, like, cotton overalls that wouldn't do nothing for you. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, my first gear I shot with a bow was in a pair of tennis shoes, blue jeans, and a T-shirt, you know. Um, of course, it was early season, and, and, you know, there's a big difference today's technologies versus even what was available back then. If you wanted something back then that was really technical like we have today, you had to go into the mountaineering industry um, and pay a lot of money for it. So, you know, the technologies and the fabrics and all of the cuts and the fits have changed and evolved so much in the outdoor industry from where it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, it's just, it makes things really more comfortable so you can stay out longer and hunt, you know, harder. Yeah, for sure. I, and I'm talking all the way back to the early 90s, but I mean, we can even just fast forward to the beginning of the 2000s. There still wasn't anything. And, uh, 
were guys like in your area, Justin, really doing that? Were they using or merging some of that mountaineering stuff for hunts? You know, very, very little. I mean, even if you go back and look at Chuck Adams and Dwight Shue and, you know, the guys that were pioneers of the industry, you know, there wasn't a ton out there, especially in camel. And, you know, back in the 90s and the 2000s, hunters would wear flannel and they would wear some camel, but a lot of the technologies, I mean, I remember wearing an army poncho to stay dry and it was just rolled up in my pack. And, you know, so, you know, it, there's definitely been some really big advances from, you know, back in the nineties and even before that to now. I mean, I look at the technologies that we do where laminates actually expand and contract with your body heat as you're hiking so that they breathe more, but they're still waterproof. I mean, you know, a lot of that stuff has evolved with the technologies that we've had nowadays. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it's really unique. I mean, we have, you know, I work in a very um, fun and unique industry to be able to bring a lot of that to market um, for the customers that buy Cryptic and other hunters out there and outdoor enthusiasts and fishing. And even if you talk about UPF and clothing, I mean, there's just some of the little things that we take for granted that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, none of, none of that, to be honest. And it's really funny that you mentioned Chuck Adams because that was like somebody I followed, you know, throughout my life, especially when I was younger. Some of the things he did and, you know, I remember vividly, you know, from magazines seeing Chuck in to, you know, books seeing Chuck in, you know, never did he have anything more than what looked like cotton camel pants and a cotton shirt. Like, so it is so crazy how far it's changed and evolved from just that because that is almost what you could only get especially if it was camoed to what you're talking now like it blows my mind that you guys have stuff that expands and breathes and then tightens back you know it's it's gone like so full 180 like justin since you've been there it's probably changed over five times too like with some of the materials you have used and, and gone through, but let's talk about that a little bit, the speed of the growth of that since you've been there. Yeah. I mean, you know, really, if you look at our first line and our mountain mimicry line to where we are today, um, I use this, you know, in a lot of our discussions when we go through things to not get frustrated with, you know, some of the pace that we've, you know, set because we've come a long ways and, you know, you know, when you look at some of the brands and some of our competitors out there, you know, and some of them that are still, you know, using old technologies, I mean, it's it's really, um, I guess, unique and, and just a tremendous uh, amount of technology that's put in. Um, our first, you know, our first round of gear, you know, wasn't, wasn't overly technical. Um, there was, you know, our ring gears were technical, but, you know, and things have evolved so fast. I mean, Primaloft, Insulate, you know, you get into allied down and the types of feathers, and now you get into hydrophobic down with, you know, synthetic fibers mixed into it. I mean, some of those things, you know, have evolved so much so fast, and they're always pushing the limit of technologies. It's it's really incredible what we're able to do to just make things a little bit more comfortable because Chuck and all those guys, I mean, they, they still, you know, killed big shit and hunted really hard. Um, but, you know, at the comfort level, that's where, you know, I guess for the average hunter, you really are able to stay just out a little bit longer and really focus and give, you know, increasing your chances. The more time you spend in the woods and the longer you can stay out there, the higher most, you know, in most cases, the higher percentage you have of being able to, you know, harvest what you're chasing or, you know, spend longer time hiking or fishing. So the technologies that and the advances that I've seen, um, in my time here, which I came on in the early days and, you know, have been really involved for about the last eight years, um, each year is a different year. I mean, you know, we try to plan two to three years out and, you know, a lot of the technologies are just starting to come out. So you've got to get fabrics tested and get it into the hands of, you know, your staff out in the field so that they can beat it up and, and give you reports back. So it's, you know, the, the industry as a whole has evolved so much, um, especially in the last, eight years, but if you look at the 20 year span, just looking in the two thousands, it's, it's mind blowing. Yeah, it is mind blowing. It, it's neat to talk about because I've kind of lived through it and it's amazing. The progression in the technology is, it has just like exploded 
And for you guys, I would assume, knowing like Butch and Josh's background, that when Cryptech first came out, it was probably, like you said, it it wasn't nearly as technical as it is today. But I, I'm sure with their military background, it was based on what they knew, and that was probably like durability. Is that correct, Jeff? Justin? Yeah, definitely. When we first came out, durability was one of the major factors because, you know, if you look at some of our original statements, you know, all these, you know, Josh and Butch were coming out of military careers. Military, you know, people as a whole don't live on a really high budget. So when they buy a pair of pants, they want it to extend as long as possible. And then also with that, there wasn't as much technology. It was just really starting to break in about 2008, you know, um, there were quite a few companies that were starting to hit it in the two, th- you know, 2000s to 2003. But you know, nobody wanted to pay $150 for a pair of hunting pants, and now that's you know kind of the average. If you want a good technical pant that's durable as well, you know, you're going to pay $100 up. So as you see how things have evolved and continue to evolve, and you know, of course, durability is is a really driving point with technology built in, because when you get overly durable you lose technical. When you get overly technical, you lose durable. Um, so d- the durability piece behind it. So there's a really fine line that we really try to run where they cross on the graph. Sometimes we get, you know, just above, you know, that midpoint into the technical side because, you know, you don't need that durable piece. But, you know, for the most part, we really try to design our pieces still with durability in mind so that it lasts for the customer um, at a good price point, but then you bring in all the technologies of the industry and incorporate it into the fabrics. And, and that also goes back into the cut. It goes into the zippers. It goes into all the components, the trims, um, you know, the adjustments on the hoods, everything. And, you know, that was the one piece I, I got to spend a lot of time um, working on the altitude line. Um, Josh and Butch had a concept of really bringing in you know, the most technical hunting piece for, you know, really that above tree line rock and scree hunter um, and bringing in the very best technologies in the world. And I searched everywhere. I flew all over. I flew all over the country and ended up in Switzerland at Scholar Technologies. And they, you know, the, the technologies that they have that they haven't even released would blow your mind. But as we dug into and found, that a lot of their fabrics were back into the alpine industry, back into, you know, the mountaineering industry because, you know, their their fabrics were incredible. And so as we started doing testing and we started to look at this and we started to price it out, we're like, oh, my gosh, this thing is, you know, it's crazy. There's no way we can put this, you know, to market. And, we, you know, we had to change a lot of things even to get it in a lower price point when we originally launched so that people would want to afford it. But, you know, it's some of the best gear, if not the best gear in the hunting industry. Yeah, that's crazy. Some of that stuff, I know, like, probably right now, like you said, is not even out yet, but some of that from Shul, is it, how do you say it again? Shoulder. Shoulder. Yeah, Shoulder. Some, some of that stuff, do you want to go into a little bit about technology-wise, what you guys are running with them? Yeah, currently um, we run three major components with Shoulder. The first is their dry skin, which is a fabric that we use a lot on our pants and one of our lightweight jackets called the Tora. And you literally could throw that jack or pant, jacket or pant in the water and almost snap it dry when you bring it out. It just literally, the water doesn't retain to the fabric and it, you know, it dries super quick. So that's our dry skin technology. Um, we also get into the sea change laminate um, in the Bora and the Takur series. And that's where, you know, you really start to get into the technical piece where the laminate will change with your body temperature. So when you get hot, it's going to breathe more. When you get, when your body's cold, it's actually going to contract and it's not going to let as much heat out because it's not as necessary. So seeing technologies like that where, you know, things are starting to change with you and do, you know, very specific things for your activity levels. Um, is where you really start to see when we talk about technologies, things that where the fabric wicks moisture away from your body and cools your body at the same time. And, you know, there's all types of different technologies that you've seen in the sports industry and in the mountaineering industry and the fishing industry that are really starting to come into play. But, you know, we specifically focus with Scholar on those two basic types, um, which we believe are cutting-edge technology. 
Yeah, that the laminate where it expands and then contracts again. I mean, that is almost like so futuristic. It's almost creepy to think that that you guys have something like that. Anybody has something like that. That is absolutely crazy. But it's so needed as well. Yeah, it, I mean, when you get into those extreme environments um, is where you really see the difference. Are you going to use it sitting in a duck blind, and is it going to really make that big a difference? No. But where you're going to see it is where you're at 8, 10, 14,000 feet, and, you know, you're really having to expend a lot of activity levels and energy, and it's wet out. And so, you know, you have to be able to thermal regulate, and that helps you with that thermal regulation. Um, the DW nanosphere, DWR nanosphere that's applied to all the products is the best DWR that I've, that I've seen. It really works well. Even when you use the technical washes, you know, it, it really holds that water on the face of the fabric so that the fabric doesn't have to work as hard. Gotcha. Yeah, that is so amazing. So some of the stuff, I know you said you guys are down the road two and three years. You know, is there something out that you guys are working on right now that you're like, man, I can't wait till this hits the market? I know you probably can't <laughs> talk about it, but just I'm sure there's stuff down the road that you're like, geez. Yeah, there is, and, yeah, I can't talk about it yet. Right. Um, but, you know, the one thing that, that we've seen a really big trend in right now is, you know, so we got the technical piece, but now – a lot of the fabrics and stuff that are technical aren't very comfortable. So incorporating specific cuts and other technical stretch fabrics in to create movement. So if you take, for example, um, you know, the normal BDU in the military never had any stretch in it. It was just, you know, a straight Nyko 50-50. But then when you start playing with different types of um, percentages of fabric, so you get a little bit more nylon than, a, than more cotton, and then maybe you mix different types of stretch fabric in there or panels um, to where now you just don't have durable, you have comfort and durability, and then you start to apply the technology piece in different parts of the fabric. So, yeah, there, I mean, it's, it, the comfort is a big thing now. Um, you know, if you go into a normal jeans store, most jeans now have some kind of a stretch in it, a four-way or a two-way, just a little bit, so it's comfort. And, you know, comfort's a big thing when you get out there, but the technical aspect of when you start to combine all the different pieces and parts together into one piece is what, what's really exciting and, and really as the end user and the customers out there, they're benefiting from, you know. And, you know, there's so much – technology going on right now with fabrics and, and so much advances, you know, you got to kind of pace yourself too, because you don't want to get too far ahead of the curve um, because all that stuff comes with a price. Um, and our altitude series definitely did that, but we were able to work through and spend a lot of time working on prices, going factory direct, um, bringing it direct to consumer only so that we could really cut down the price so that everybody that wanted to use it would, it would be in a price point that it, you know, they would be able to get it and put it to good use, and it lasts, you know, for the time that you expect it to. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge thing, and it's a huge thing that, you know, express what you guys do because a lot of guys just kind of see a price tag, and they don't know all that technology. They don't know that some of the, like you said, the technology has kind of sometimes taken away from the comfort. Now you guys are merging those two. That's a big thing to me is, you know, from the whitetail side, because I'm a whitetail hunter, if you're not comfortable, guess what that means? You're literally moving. That means you're agitated, your head's moving, your hips are moving, I'm standing up or standing down, and that's a red flag. You know, I want to be as as I can, and, and that means comfort and being, motion, you know, not moving, motionless. So that's awesome to hear you guys say that you guys are, you know, as much focusing on that as everything else. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different aspects. I mean, when you start to get into one of the one, one of the pieces that I think that's just incredible is to take a down goose feather and then treat it so that it lasts, you know, longer when it gets wet. And then they start to infuse synthetic fibers in there. When you get into the Primaloft Gold series, um, it's just, you know, it kind of blows your mind. And to think about, you know, the technology and how they work, and then you just go back to a normal cotton. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of people call, you know, cotton is a death fabric. But when you're, you know, out in Texas and it's, you know, 90% humidity and it's hot, cotton works great. 
you know, so there's different fabrics for different types of environments and different types of usage, and, you know, each of them have their place. And that's the neat part is being able to define out each type of product for each scenario and each fabric and the technology that goes into it. No, that's absolutely true. So being that, which is, you know, unique for you in that position, you know, like from what I hear, you're a kick-ass elk hunter and mule deer hunter, and I want to get dive into that, you know, for a little bit here. But it's so neat that you get to do that too and figure out these technologies, these fabrics, and, you know, on your hunt, that's got to be such a huge advantage for helping you get it out to consumers. Yeah, it is. And, you know, um, I'm an elk die hard nut like i i love elk hunting i grew up elk hunting with a bow with my father and he instilled that um in me um when i was little um and i'll i'll share a little story with you i was 11 years old and i remember um, my dad getting ready with my brother-in-law going on their annual elk hunt um at the first of september and i remember you know 15 days before them starting to plan and talk about it and going on scouting trips and coming back and hearing the excitement and, you know, I just, it was in my blood from the time I was born. I didn't really have a choice. It just was in me and I loved it. And I remember I had an old bear bow, which was a compound at the time, but it was, it was old. It was now looking at bows is a whole different story. But I remember taking a, you know, can of spray paint and like trying to get some of the white gold down and, you know, practicing in the yard and setting up my targets and making ranges and, you know, shooting from the roof and shooting within the trees. And, you know, I spent a lot of time and, and I just, you know, kept talking to my dad, hey, I'm going this year. I packed my stuff and everything. And, and my dad didn't have, you know, it, didn't have it in him to tell me that I wasn't going. And so they just slipped away um, the day before the hunt. And I couldn't find him. And I was so, you know, disappointed and so sad that I didn't get to go on that hunt because I knew I was getting old enough. And I remember at the time, you know, I knew that if I was going to, you know, be able to go on that hunt because my dad was very – focused on getting animals because we lived off the meat we had a big family and and i got five brothers and sisters and so you know we would get an elk and a couple deer every year and that's what we you know used through the winter um with my dad being a school teacher and i literally just started racking my brain on how can i become an asset into hunting and i'd been watching tons and tons of elk films and you know back then it was you know vhs tapes and um I just started calling elk with my voice. So before, you know, they got back, I could actually put out a pretty good bugle. And by the middle of the season, I could bugle really well. So I needless to say, I never got left again behind um, <laughs> on future That's hunts cool. because I literally, you know, taught myself how to bugle. And so elk hunting is a passion of mine. I really like it. It just comes naturally. And I really like calling bull elk in and, 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 you know, just talking to elk is a lot of fun and learning, you know, how to outsmart the big bulls and the different calls that they make and, and just really being part of them and, and trying to, you know, sneak in with bow range and, you know, be successful. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It seems that elk, elk hunting is a science in its own, and that's neat that you said that about VHS. It's like that literally was my youth, you know, for on the whitetail side. That's all I did and uh just obsessed over it kind of like you know sounds like you did as well but it's neat that you figured that niche out to become an asset like you said and so from when you started justin to like now you know as an elk hunter you know what things have really changed for you as an elk hunter and in, in kind of your your plan every year like is it more preseason scouting or what has made you involved over the years you know Elk hunting as a whole has evolved because I think the elk have gotten a lot smarter um, because, you know, you have all of these people out in the industry that are creating calls. Um, I remember at, you know, 12 and 13 years old, you know, taking predator calls, which we now call cow calls, and modifying them with different reeds and, and plastics to create sounds. And, you know, until I was probably in my, you know, early 20s, I could be with my voice, so I didn't have to use a reed. But you know, things have changed and evolved so much and there's so much more information out there and with everybody having a phone and the technology that we have um, pushed out there, I think that, you know, elk hunting as a whole, to learn to be an elk hunter, um, the information's out there and you can learn it really quick, but nothing 
um, will ever replace experience. Um, you know, I've called in thousands and thousands of bulls. Um, I was really lucky to be on a hunt the last couple of years down in Arizona and some really select um, areas, you know, on 1.2 million acres um, and hunt and see elk in their natural habitat and reacting normally versus a public land Idaho or a public land Colorado bull um, and just seeing how well they respond. And, you know, the public land elk hunting in all the western states is definitely a lot tougher from when I grew up. I mean, it didn't take much to call bull in back then. And it definitely is a lot harder now between the wolves and the pressure and the popularity of bow hunting in general. Um, you know, picking up a bow nowadays is a lot different. Um, you know, we would spend hours and days and weekends and months practicing to be good enough out to 40 yards because the technologies back then weren't very good. So as a whole, you know, I think that you could become, you know, a fairly decent elk hunter, you know, in today's age and have some success versus, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you had to be a, a good archery elk hunter and to call elk, you, you know, you had to do a lot of time and put a lot of effort in, but you know, with all the technologies out there and all the information um, at your fingertips, you know, you can really learn a lot really fast. Yeah. I mean, definitely the age of the internet has helped, you know, there's so much more info. It's not even funny. And I'm totally with you on, I I feel like I see the same thing with deer. Just deer have gotten smarter. Whitetails have gotten smarter. They've seen those tricks, and it's like they just, it's in their DNA now, and they pass that on. It, and I have no background in biology or anything. I just totally believe that is the truth, that uh, they, somehow it's embedded in their DNA that they have been able to, you know, take these, you know, little calls we do, tricks we do everything we do to try to kill them and when they outsmart us it's like a check mark in their dna but uh i'm sure elk are the same way if not smarter it's uh you know everybody talks so highly of elk hunting that uh you know like one of those things once you do it once you know you're addicted and i've yet to, to been able to do it and uh it's been on my list for a long time and hopefully soon but do you have anything you know you're super excited about this here justin as far as uh, you know, a certain hunt you drew a tag for or, or potentially going out of state or what do you got going on? You know, I have a really uh, special hunt actually more than anything, but um, coming up this year, I grew up in southeastern Idaho and my father passed um, on Father's Day this year. And I spent a lot of time down there hunting with my father growing up. And I have an opportunity to go down and hunt some of the same areas that I grew up hunting that he had. Um, in some really good locations with a lot of bulls. Um, I even went and scouted a little bit for, during my family reunion. So I'm really looking forward to that because I get to relive some of the early days of um, hunting with my dad and some of those experiences. So that's probably one of the ones I'm looking forward to the most. But, you know, I've got um, some hunts coming up, multiple elk hunts, a couple with a bow, um, with a rifle, and then I spent a lot of time with my kids in the outdoors. Um, even when they were little, my son, uh, 10 years old last year, shot his first whitetail, mountain whitetail, mind you, um, at 750. And, you know, so I spent a lot of time practicing with them and, you know, giving them the opportunity. We bear hunt in the spring. Um, we elk hunt. So, you know, my, my time, you know, in the outdoors, you know, testing is just, you know, it ends up, really working into my lifestyle. And, and we talk a lot about it, lifestyle by design. Um, we still work hard and we spend a lot of time in the office, but, you know, it's becoming more of a lifestyle by design, you know, each year and being able to spend, you know, four to five months out in the woods, you know, hunting and, you know, fishing in the springs and the summers. And so I've got quite a few hunts um, lined up this year that should be really exciting. Um, I would hunt you know, 30 days in September with archery, if I could, and I would give up everything else. But I love chasing big mule deer, too. There's something about mule deer in the rut. Um, we have a Colorado mule deer rut every year that Prime Revolution um, takes Butch and I on, and we get to go down there and hunt um, big mule deer in the rut in November. And, you know, that two- to three-week time period where those big bucks are just stomping around and fighting – you know, that's a very unique experience, too. So not quite as, you know, it's a different excitement. It's not like calling a big bull elk into eight yards and having them scream in your face. 
but, you know, spotting and stalking and putting yourself in the position to take a, a big meal, mature mule deer is a lot of fun. Um, a lot of planning that goes in and a lot of time sitting behind the glass, um, trying to find, you know, those bucks and put yourself in the position to be successful. That's a, that's a really fun, um, hunt as well. Yeah, I bet. I, I think mule deer hunting is super cool and I've had great experience doing it and, uh, have dream about doing it again, but, uh, I didn't get to do it during the rut. It was early season, uh, you know, bow hunt, but seeing mule deer do that during the rut, I bet you is super exciting and, and as well, super addicting to say the, le- the least. And I know some of the mule deer Butch has killed, like if that obviously means you guys are hunting in a phenomenal area. So it's probably even 10 times fold as exciting as it could be for, for, uh, majority of us i would say you know like not i don't mean that condescendingly but i just mean that uh you know it's everything especially for being like non-resident you know out west is based on drawing tags you know what i mean it's so hard to draw some of those rut tags yeah yeah it's you know i remember um as a kid my dad always telling me you'll never see the hunting that we see today that we see as we get older and I think there's a couple aspects that come into that. He always told me that, you know, hunting was going to become a rich man's sport. You know, I remember when an elk tag was 1150, you didn't have to have an archery stamp and you could just go hunt and you could hunt archery and you could hunt rifle. But as the popularity's grown and as we want to manage the herds as responsibly as possible, um, you know, it really changes things. So, you know, being from the East or the Midwest, being able to come out and hunt, you know, probably isn't as easy as opportunity as it used to be, um, especially, you know, if you, you know, have a budget in mind. But there's still some great opportunities out there. There's a lot of companies that put out good good information, Eastland's Hunting Journal, um, Hunt and Fool, um, Go Hunt. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there that really produce a lot of articles that let you know. So there's still a lot of public land, over-the-counter opportunities out there um, that are available if you want to put the time in to research it. And, you know, there's so much information out there to be able to find it. It's not like, you know, 10 or even 15 years ago, you know, when if you didn't know somebody or have experience, it wasn't written on a blog or in a podcast or on a YouTube video. I mean, you either had to read it in an Eastman's Hunting Journal magazine or, you know, maybe one of their, their early VHS videos um, of Gordon Eastman, you know, he was really a pioneer of bringing a lot of that to the forefront and, and you know, videoing his expeditions. But, you know, it's, there's so many types of big game in, you know, the West to hunt, you know, but elk and deer are definitely my favorite. Yeah, no, that's super cool. That would be mine too as well if I lived out West. But I know, uh, you know, and again, I'm speaking from a guy from the Midwest and you, you live there and grew up there. It, I probably just, you know, on myself, make it seem so much harder than it is. But some of the companies you mentioned just a few minutes ago in the podcast, like those are great avenues to learn. Like I watch a lot of their YouTube videos and stuff like that and have have learned more, forgot more of what I've learned than I should have from those guys because there is some really good opportunities. If you, you know, kind of like the old VHSs, if you, sometimes you almost got to like just bring a pen and pad and write some of these the stuff down. I've done that several times to check on properties in other states and that's a huge help. But those companies that you mentioned that those are great avenues to learn stuff for sure. That was, you know, a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. And they're both, they're both great, you know, great companies. Um, know them very well personally, each, of the, each of the members of their companies and, you know, they really put a lot of pride and a lot of quality in what they put out. Um, and so, you know, for all you guys listening out there, they're, both of them are great companies to, you know, read their publications, read their digital forums, read, watch their YouTube videos. I mean, there's a lot of information out there, you know, to be able to have um, opportunities to hunt, you know, big game out west nowadays. Which ties back to, you yeah, know, great gear. There is. You gotta and, take, and, you gotta... Yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. Yeah, no. So, as you're a resident in Idaho, right? Is that correct, Justin? Say that again? I said you're a resident in Idaho, right? Still, or still am? Yep. Okay. Yep, so, I've been a resident, born and raised here. That's awesome. So, for you, is 
do you have to do some of those same things or do you have to apply for certain zones or draws for your elk and mule deer tag? Yeah, even Idaho is, is getting tougher and tougher. They have capped zones now um, this year in order to hunt in that um, unit where I grew up in. You're, you know, 30 minutes before on your laptop refreshing, waiting and trying to buy and the tag sold out in less than 28 minutes this year. So wow. if you're not, you know, not on top of it, and that's just for an archery elk A tag. Um, it doesn't span over into rifle. You know, you don't get a hunt of a bull with a rifle anymore like you used to as a kid when I grew up. But, you know, so you kind of got to pick and choose. Um, the one thing that's unique about Idaho is there is a lot of, you know, opportunities that cross over where you'll get an A tag in a unit or a zone over the counter, and then you can hunt a secondary um, species or animal type. So, like, in a lot of the zones, you'll get a quality A tag, which is a bull or a cow, and then maybe towards the end of October, you will be able to hunt with a, for a spike or a muzzleloader cow. So you still have multiple opportunities in Idaho, which makes it great. Montana, you know, they've got a really great system where their tags are a little bit more expensive, but, you know, you get, you know, 45-plus days to hunt with a bow, and then you get a whole bunch, 30 to 60 days of the rifle, depending on which areas you're in. So there's still a lot of great opportunities and extended seasons to hunt multiple, but it's definitely getting harder. You have to really stay on top of that information and know what area you want to go to and know what days the tags are launching or to put in for specific draws for, you know, the big mature animals that we all love to chase. Yeah, exactly. No, that is uh, super true that you have to be on it. And uh, this year, just based on my own experience, you know, with the whole COVID thing, (laughs) that I was trying to draw and not to take out of state tag somewhere. Uh, they needed my hunter safety cer- certificate and my state here in Michigan couldn't provide that because of the, they didn't have workers, employees working from the state. So, you know, it just, I bet you, you know, just listen to you talk like this year probably screwed up a lot of guys like, you know, with all this stuff and, Potentially, I don't know how hard like Idaho, if I was a non-resident or Montana, but where I was going was that difficult, but I'm sure I'm not the only one, but it's just funny that you have to pay that much attention to that stuff or like you said, you're just not going to get a tag. Yeah, it's, um, you definitely have to be a little bit more and there's a lot of services out there that help you track that now as you know, all of our schedules are busy, but you know, it, it definitely, there's, you know, there's still some great opportunities, you know, if you're willing to put in the time and the research for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we're coming up on time, Justin. I want to respect your time and, uh, but man, awesome podcast. Thanks for talking some hunting and some awesome gear with me today. And, and, uh, best of luck on the awesome hunt you're drawn back in your, your home area where you and your dad hunted. And I hope you kill an awesome elk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on, and, you know, I, I appreciate that, and it was good talking with you, and, and uh, hopefully I have some success this fall, and you can have me back on, I can tell you about how awesome the hunt was. Yeah, absolutely, man. Let's do it, and, yeah, I wish you well, and uh, and as everybody knows, make sure you check out Cryptech, and you can find this podcast every week on Unfiltered Outdoor app and on iTunes, and thanks again, Justin. Yeah, thank you.